Hello and welcome to our special broadcast. I'm Arshna Solanki. Here are the headlines we are tracking this hour. For me, the interest of my investor is paramount and everything is secondary. Gautam Adani puts on a brave face after an unprecedented move of withdrawing fully subscribed 20,000 crore rupee FPO. Adani says it would not be morally correct to proceed with the FPO and adds that the group's business operations have not been impacted. Adani Group has lost nearly 9 lakh crore rupees in market capitalization in one week. The Reserve Bank seeks information from banks on their exposure to the Adani Group. RBI sources say that it's a standard practice to seek information if new developments take place and regulated companies have exposure. We learn that RBI's central database may not have the latest information, especially those linked to pledge shares. <laughs> Opposition party stage a walkout after Lok, Lok Sabha Speaker and Rajya Sabha Deputy Chairman refused to allow an urgent debate on the allegations of stock manipulation and accounting fraud against the Adani Group. Parties have also demanded a joint parliamentary committee probe and a Supreme Court monitored inquiry into the matter. Stock markets recover in the last hour, led by private banks and FMCG stocks. Sensex gains over 200 points. Nifty ends marginally in the red. Investors digest the U.S. Federal Reserve's 25 basis points hike in commentary. The government moves to unclog the deal clearance pipeline. Centers, law officers say that the CCI's quorum requirement can be waived off. The law ministry allows the MCA to invoke the doctrine of necessity to allow deal clearances despite the required quorum of three members. That's an exclusive. Darbar and Titan report a soft third quarter. Darbar's profit and revenue miss estimates even though margins were higher than expected. Titan's revenue was above estimates but it missed expectation on all other parameters. Shares of Facebook parent Meta rally even as quarterly revenue declines for the first time in its history. Mark Zuckerberg promises 2023 will be a year of efficiency, announces a $40 billion buyback. The top story this evening, Adani Enterprises has decided to pull the plug on its 20,000 crore rupee follow-on public offer, even though it was fully subscribed. The rare move, never seen before in Indian capital market history, caused panic across the Adani Group's listed entities. In a regulatory filing, the company said it will refund the FPO proceeds to investors, citing market volatility and the fall in its share prices as the reason. Adani stocks have been under constant pressure after American short seller Hindenburg published a report raising several red flags. Ever since the report was released, Adani Group's market cap eroded by nearly 10 lakh crore rupees. At its peak, the conglomerate's market capitalization was at nearly 25 lakh crore rupees. Just before the Hindenburg report was released on January 24th, the market cap was under 20 lakh crore rupees. Today, it stands at just over 10 lakh crore rupees. In a rare public appearance, Group CEO Gautam Adani said the FPO was being withdrawn because it was not morally correct to proceed with it. Adani also added that the FPO withdrawal will not impact existing operations. Considering the volatility of the market seen yesterday, our board strongly felt that it would not have been morally correct to proceed with the FPO. For me, the interest of my investor is paramount and everything is secondary. This decision will not have any impact on our existing operations as well as our future plans. We will continue to focus on timely executions and delivery of projects. Once the market stabilizes, we will review our capital market strategy. Meanwhile, the Reserve Bank has sought information from banks on their exposure to the Adani Group. Uh, Shreen Bhan joins us now. Shreen, uh, what are you picking up? 
Uh, hi. Well, yes, uh, what we are given to understand is that the regulator has asked banks for uh, information uh, about the exposure to the Adani group. Now, remember, uh, this is not as if the Reserve Bank is, uh, is taking some action. This is what we're given to understand as part of the standard operating protocol, given the fact that there have been significant developments that have taken place with respect to the Adani group over the last few days. Now, as part of the standard protocol, the RBI is asking regulated entities, i.e banks uh, if there are any fresh developments that uh, the Reserve Bank needs to be aware of that may not have been factored in as far as the central database is concerned which is Krillic. Now oh, Krillic does get updated weekly as well as monthly. Different data sets are updated weekly or monthly and because there has been so much volatility uh, in the Adani group stocks and pledge shares etc. Uh, just as far as uh, abundant caution is concerned the Reserve Bank has asked banks uh, for any updated information that will clarify on any doubts that may arise. Uh, what we are also uh, seeing, which is clear, are statements coming in from various banks that do have exposure to the Adani Group. This morning we heard from IDFC Bank saying that uh, there is no concern that the bank has. We heard similarly from State Bank of India. So individual banks also coming out uh, and issuing statements on their exposure to the Adani Group as well as where things currently stand. So uh, this is the RBI seeking updated information uh, from banks as part of the standard operation operating protocol given the sharp volatility that we have seen in the last few days. All right. Uh, thank you, Shreen, for uh, those details. Uh, meanwhile, Life Insurance Corporation of India, a key investor in Adani, has lost more than 38,000 crore rupees of its investment value in just one week. Yes, Shen is here with more. Uh, yes, what is the latest? Uh, well, we've been reporting on this story from day one. Uh, the, the, the fall that we've seen in Adani Group stocks has had uh, some sort of collateral damage as far as India's largest equity investor, the institutional investor, LIC, is also concerned. This is the sixth straight day of uh, fall in the investment value uh, for LIC in the Adani Group stocks. So we put uh, some numbers together and what we've been, uh, what we understand from the numbers is that LIC's investment value has halved since uh, uh, January 24th when that report was released and the fall in Adani Group stocks started. As of today, LIC's value, investment value in Adani Group stocks, that stands at 43,000 crore rupees versus 81,300 crore rupees on January 24th. We've also uh, got another interesting statistic. Now LIC is left with just about 12,800 crore of investment profit in Adani Group stocks. Remember, this number on January 24th stood at 51,200 crore rupees. So numbers have fallen very quickly as far as LIC's own investment book in Adani Group stocks is concerned. But at the end of the day, if you look at LIC, we call LIC the largest institutional investors. And this is a very small portion of their total investment book. Out of the total AUM, Adani investment was just 0.97%. Out of the equity AUM which LIC has, Adani Group uh, investments stood at about 8%. All right, uh, thank you, Yash, uh, for those details. All right, moving on. The Adani crisis struck the parliament today. Opposition parties came together asking the government for a debate on the issue, raising questions about the exposure of state run banks and LIC. There was chaos in parliament after both uh, Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. Uh, speaker and uh, Rajya Sabha's deputy chairman rejected the opposition's request. Both houses were adjourned for the day without any business taking place. Opposition parties are demanding a joint parliamentary panel to probe the matter or an investigation monitored by the Chief Justice of India. सरकारी इंस्टीट्यूशंस हैं दिए हैं इसकी एक जांच होना चाहिए इसके लिए हम इस चर्चा में डिमांड करना चाहते हैं या तो जॉइंट पार्लियामेंट्री कमेटी हो या सुप्रीम कोर्ट के जो चीफ जस्टिस हैं उनके नेतृत्व में इसकी एन्क्वायरी हो और डे टू डे रिपोर्ट भी जनता के सामने रखे आप भारत वैशिंग ब्रिगेड के एजेंडे को जो है वो आप देश में लागू करना चाहते हैं क्या देश पे हावी करना चाहते हैं क्या देश को हाईजेक करना चाहते हैं कि उस पार्लियामेंट की प्रोसीडिंग को हाईजेक करना चाहते हैं इस तरह के नॉन इशू और इस तरह के गैर जिम्मेदार इशू से 
All right, a quick programming note. Catch the Budget Architects live today from 5 p.m. onwards on our special broadcast, The Budget Verdict. Union Minister Nitin Gadkari will be speaking exclusively to Shirin Bhan on the government's roadmap for the road, transport and highway sector. We will also be speaking to CEA Anant Nageshwar and Niti Aayog CEO Parmeshwar and Iyer, top budget makers, uh, Revenue Secretary Sanjay Malhotra, Deepam Secretary Tuhin Kanta Pandey and CBDD Chief Nitin Gupta will be joining us to explain the budget Budget math. We will also be bringing you exclusive interactions with CBIC Chief Vivek Jori, Renewable Energy Secretary Bhupinder Bhalla and DPIIT Secretary Anurag Jain. Meanwhile, the stock market saw some wild swings. A late recovery led by private banks and FMCG stocks took the Sensex higher by 200 points. The Nifty ended marginally in the red despite the late pullback. Overnight, the U.S. Federal Reserve announced a 25 basis point rate hike. Federal Chairman said that the disinflationary process has begun. However, he also cautioned that it's too soon to declare victory over inflation. I would say it is a, it is a good thing that the, the disinflation that we have seen so far has not come at the expense of a weaker labor market. But I would also say that, that that disinflationary process that you now see underway uh, is really at an early stage. It would be premature, it would be very premature to declare victory or to, to think that we've really got this. All right, to moving on, life insurance stocks continue to witness volatile trade a day after the union budget, uh, although a few stocks recovered in the last hour. The budget proposed taxing payouts received from life insurance policy is issued after April 2023. If the total life insurance premium paid in a year exceeds 5 lakh rupees. Shares of HDFC Life is among the top losers as it has a large share of large ticket policies as compared to other players. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive, the government has moved to unclog the deal clearance pipeline. Centre's law officers have said that the CCI's quorum requirement can be waived off. The law ministry allows the Corporate Affairs Ministry to invoke the doctrine of necessity. Parikshit Luthra is here with the details. That's right, the decks have been cleared for approval of crucial merger and acquisition deals at the Competition Commission of India. At least 20 combination deals worth $1.3 billion have been stuck for the last four months as the CCI did not have the quorum required to clear deals. The CCI currently has only two members, with one doubling up as chairperson against a quorum requirement of three members. Sources now telling CNBC TV18 that the government's top law officers have recommended that the quorum requirement be waived off as the process of appointment of new chairperson and other members will take time. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs, which is the nodal body for the CCI, has received a nod from the law ministry to invoke the doctrine of necessity. We hear that the approvals for the first set of MNAs may come as early as this Friday and more deals could be cleared next week. CNBC TV18 had earlier reported that the CCI had approached the Ministry of Corporate Affairs to waive the quorum requirement as the process of approving MNAs, FDI proposals and corporate insolvency resolution cases had been badly hit due to the lack of a full-time chairperson and the required quorum. Right, uh, thank you Parikshit uh, for those details. Well, it's time for a short break, but coming up, Budget 2023 puts forth measures to boost Gift City in Gujarat. A special discussion with Njeti Srinivas, chairperson of IFSCA, when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching CNBC TV 18. Now, the union budget, remember, has also announced several measures which gives more importance um, and big impetus to Gujarat's gift city and the International Financial Services Center on the whole. It currently houses many of these financial services companies and is also gaining more traction. In terms of um, some of those important uh, you know, announcements in the budget, there was delegation of powers under SEC Act to uh, 
IFSCA and single window clearance given amongst all the regulators put together, permitting acquisition financing and also enabling arbitration and other ancillary services. These are big moves and let me welcome on the show Injeti Srinivas, uh, who is the chairperson of International Financial Services Center Authority and is also really uh, been instrumental in creating this as a hub for India. Uh, and Jetty Srinivas, always a pleasure to have you on CNBC TV 18. Now, my first question, what are the big highlights and impact of the budget 2023, which is really going to give a boost to Gift City IFSC? So I think uh, it's a sort of watershed moment uh, for the Gift IFSC. Yeah. Uh, given its importance as a project of national importance, uh, government uh, in the previous years also has been uh, giving, uh, you know, support uh, in, in various ways. But uh, some of the very, very uh, impactful decisions have been taken in this budget. And uh, one is, uh, you know, further empowering the authority uh, to become uh, a unified regulator. So there will be a single interface as far as the investor is concerned for obtaining approvals. So uh, one of the uh, decisions is that since the IFSC is located in a uh, SEZ, all the approvals required uh, from the uh, SEZ angle, now those powers are being delegated to the IFSCA. So that is one part of it. The second part of it is that when uh, a domestic entity uh, sets up shop uh, in the IFSC, if it's a regulated entity, they may require approval or NOC of the domestic regulator. Even for making offshore direct investment, they would require the approval of RBI. Now, all these, as of now, separately, the investor has to make applications and obtain all the approvals. And sometimes the cumulative time which is taken uh, becomes, uh, you yes. know, uh, Longish. Right. With so I want to ask you that now that this delegation of power has taken place and IFSCA under your leadership is a work going on under pro progress right now, in how much time will you be able to clear, create this single window clearance? I think it's work in progress already. Yes. Uh, because, you know, it's a little complicated because what happens is, uh, you know, we have uh, certain requirements, we have our forms, uh, SEZ has its forms, RBI, SEBI, everybody will have. So what we have really done is to minimize the burden of the uh, applicant, we have seen what is the common pieces of information all uh, uh, different uh, regulators and agencies require. And we are trying to have a system where uh, uh, there is no duplication. So when the form is filled up, there'll be one common part where those uh, pieces of information will be through an API system shared for the other regulators also. And the regulator specific information only will be filled in, uh, you know, by the applicant. So right. one is that uh, the, 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 the information burden, the information burden on the applicant is reduced. Second, it's a time bound approval system. Yes. And the sequence of which approval has to precede which approval. Yes. Uh, and approval has to follow which approval. So it's a very tightly controlled thing. Uh, so I think it will be very uh, beneficial. And uh, it, if I want to sort of indicate something similar in the corporate affairs, when you incorporate a company, you have what's called the SPICE Plus, which actually through one form, you get 10 different approvals, yes. uh, including... STN and you know the labor uh, you know EPFO and all those approvals. So this is modeled on that. Yes. Uh, we are we are, uh, we are working on it and hopefully in uh, less than six months this should become operational. Okay, less than six months. That's a clear headline coming for you from you for many aspirants of uh, the gift city. But in Jetty Srinivas, one thing that really caught my attention was the acquisition financing to be allowed by the banks which are going to be present. How is this going to work? Have you already seen interest from the banks? Give us a little more sense into it. Yeah, so I think, you know, acquisition finance is uh, uh, quite popular overseas. And today we have uh, a fairly decent concentration of foreign banks in the gift uh, IFSC. I think there are 10 odd banks. And uh, they have been, uh, you know, making uh, requests uh, to be enabled to do acquisition finance. Uh, there are some limitations in the Banking Regulation Act. 
uh, which say that a bank uh, cannot hold more than 30% shares in a, a company uh, or cannot deploy more than 30% of their share capital uh, you know, for uh, uh, a company. Uh, so this has become, in a way, uh, uh, an impediment for acquisition finance because typically when you do acquisition finance, your security is the shares, uh, both of the company which is acquiring and the company which is being acquired. Uh, by this uh, uh, sort of carve out, uh, the foreign uh, banking units will be allowed to do this. Right now, because the Reserve Bank of India does not allow the Indian banks uh, to do acquisition finance uh, beyond the prescribed limits, and yes. if you can't have more than shares, I'm afraid the Indian uh, uh, branches of the Indian banks would not be able to do it, but the foreign uh, IBUs, in, uh, IFSC banking units, will be able to do it. It's a big thing because uh, this is very common in a, when, 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 when you're uh, developing uh, rapidly, a lot of uh, uh, corporate restructuring take place, a lot of mergers, demergers, all these things take place. Yes. And acquisition finance makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, so not for Indian banks as yet. RBI doesn't permit with the, uh, beyond a certain threshold. That's an important clarity coming in. But nonetheless, it will be important for reducing costs for the Indian corporates who are going to avail of this. Now, my final question to you in Jetty Srinivas, very little time. Uh, what is the traction so far that you are seeing at the Gift City? It's very encouraging, Nisha. In fact, uh, I think in the last uh, uh, six months to, uh, say, nine months, we have seen huge traction in the funds industry. Uh, in such a short time, there are more than 50 funds and uh, more than 50 uh, fund management entities which have been set up. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, the total amount, uh, uh, committed amount is uh, exceeded 11 billion. So in a short span, uh, this sort of traction, I think is very encouraging. The same thing applies to the banking industry. Uh, today, the combined assets have crossed, uh, you know, 37, 38 billion. Uh, in a very short span, this has also happened. Reinsurance is another emerging area. But I would just conclude by uh, uh, bringing to your attention one major announcement which the FM made, and yes. that is offshore derivative instruments. Uh, yes. Now, this is a very important thing. Yes. I mean, commonly referred to as participatory notes. Uh, in the past, you know, we have had a, a, a mixed response to participatory notes uh, because at one point it peaked, it was over 4 lakh crore. Yes. Now what's the part note is basically foreign investors not actually registering themselves sure. in the uh, Indian capital market, but being able to take this as total return swaps from the banks. Yes. Uh, but today it still exists and it is concentrated in uh, France and you know sure. Singapore. And the idea is we should not export our capital market abroad. We should yes. not export our financial market abroad. Yes. We have it within our own country and because we have capital account uh, convertibility restrictions yes is the place where you don't have it and we should be the net importers of financial services uh, and that's the center that you're creating in jetty Srinivas. always a pleasure speaking to you thanks so much for joining us with that it's a wrap on this special broadcast on budget 2023 impact and news and updates continue on the other side stay tuned